In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Inshallah continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Asiratul Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography In the previous session we started the discussion about the battle of Khandaq Also known as Ghazwatul Ahzab Which means the battle against the allied army and <clears throat> we discussed about how this transpired in the fifth year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina, the fifth year of Hijrah. And we discussed what were some of the events that led up to this situation, this scenario, and talked about how there was an entire plan and a conspiracy um, that started with the Meccans, involved um, some of the other uh, Bedouin tribes uh, from the uh, Arabian uh, Peninsula. So some of the Bedouin tribes are around the area of the city of Medina. We also talked about how some of the Jews that were in and around the city of Medina had also conspired in regards to this. Many of the Jewish tribes that were ousted due to violating the constitution of the city of Medina, and they had taken up residence in the city of Khaybar, in the area of Khaybar, they were also at the forefront of leading this entire, uh, you know, uh, leading this entire battle and front against the Prophet wasallam and against the Muslims. So we talked about the beginning of the battle, what led up to it and what transpired exactly, how the army uh, gathered together the allied army eventually they all came together and were marching towards the city of Medina we talked about how the Prophet Wasallam consulted with the Muslims and said exactly what do we do because we are in no position to go out and fight you know thousands upon thousands upon thousands of individuals out in the battlefield that's just marching people out to the slaughter so that's not really an, op- uh, an option here so what do we exactly do and at that point in time, we talked about how Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and I mentioned how we discussed uh, f- way further back in the beginning of the, um, you know, the study of the seerah where we talked about the prophecies before even the revelation to the Prophet wasallam, and how Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, had a very remarkable story. Well, his story further develops because he shortly before the Battle of the Trench, Battle of Khandaq, he ends up being able to earn his freedom and he becomes a full-fledged member of the community at that time where he's able to participate and he offers the suggestion of digging a trench around the city of Medina to obstruct the path of the army that is headed towards the city of Medina. So now we last time talked about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ distributed the Sahaba into different groups and he assigned them different portions around the city of Medina where they started digging the trench. And we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ himself took part in the digging of the trench. The Sahaba talk about how they saw that the entire chest and the stomach of the Prophet ﷺ, the entire front of his body was completely covered in dirt. And how the Prophet ﷺ was out there working and digging as well. And we talked about the beautiful narrations where the Prophet ﷺ noticed that the Sahaba were hungry, they were weak, and they were struggling, but they kept on digging and they kept on working. And the Prophet ﷺ was make, making these beautiful du'as for them. Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirah. Allahumma la khaira illa khairu al-akhirah. Oh Allah, there is nothing better than the life of the hereafter. Faghfir al-ansar wal-muhajirah. That, oh Allah, forgive the ansar and the muhajireen. 
Forgive all of these companions who are working so hard and diligently to protect the community. And so, and we, I also mentioned about how they were chanting, and when they would hear the Prophet ﷺ say this, they would respond, that we are the ones who have given the oath of allegiance to Muhammad wasallam. that we will continue to defend the deen of Allah, and we will continue to strive and struggle as long as we have a single breath left in our body. And when they would say that, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Abada, Abada. He would also re- respond to their chants. And in this manner, everybody with all of this vigor and conviction and energy and enthusiasm in spite of their condition kept on going to keep digging this trench to secure the defense of the city of Medina. What I wanted to talk about here is that where we will be transitioning to is talking about the actual arrival of the Meccan army, the Allied army rather I should say, the Meccans, the Jewish tribes, the Bedouin tribes, that entire Allied army. We will talk about their arrival outside of the city of Medina, outside of the trench, and then exactly what transpires between them and how they end up interacting with one another and what eventually is the outcome of this entire situation. What I wanted to talk about here today is still the period where they are still digging the trench. And what I was going to remo- uh, what I was going to discuss today or present today is some very miraculous, breathtaking stories and incidents of the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming in the most you know unpredictable and unimaginable fashion, coming to the aid of the Prophet and the Muslims. So one of the things I mentioned previously is some of the Sahaba say that we, we were digging the trench and Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu relates this. He says that اشتدت عليهم في بعض الخندق كدية فشكوها إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم That they ran into certain large rocks or boulders if you will while digging that made it very difficult for them to continue digging and they couldn't break it. They, it was so huge they couldn't lift it. So they finally, it's you know figuratively, they hit the proverbial wall and they didn't know what to do. They tried everything that they could, but they couldn't figure it out. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Oh Messenger of God, please help us. We don't know what to do. A couple of things here, and I always, um, you know, try, at least attempt, to try to do this uh, during our discussions on the seerah, that instead of just telling the story and mentioning names and dates and places and facts, what what I find to be very beneficial for me personally as I'm researching and preparing and reading and what I like to try to share with the brothers and sisters is uh, are some of the observations about the character and the behavior, the conduct, the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ. And similarly, some notable things about some of the conduct and the behavior of the Sahaba, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. So what's very fascinating here is the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of leading the community, and leading a major operation here. And we can take guidance from this, not only in the realm of community, but we are supposed to, contrary to popular thoughts, we are supposed to take guidance in this regard, even in the area of our own personal, maybe business dealings, right? That somebody might find themselves in the position of being an employer, or a supervisor, that the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ is just as relevant in the realm of business as it is in the realm of community. And we have to understand that, that a lot of times somebody else might be telling us something, but we have beli- we, we return, فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ We go back to God and His Messenger wasallam, And their guidance is the ultimate guidance and the best guidance. So what I wanted to elaborate on here is that the Prophet ﷺ is leading this major operation. Major project, consider it, right? You have a thousand, over a thousand Sahaba digging a trench, you know, miles long, all around, you know, uh, 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 along one side of the city of Medina, from mountain to mountain. And so all of this is going on, but the Prophet ﷺ, rather than sitting back at a perch, 
And the Prophet ﷺ kind of like overseeing the operations and supervising and you know directing traffic and telling people go do this, go do that. And if you have a situation, you go talk to somebody else but don't disturb me. I have to maintain kind of my you know position and I have to keep a view over what things are going on. I understand the practicality of having maybe a particular you know uh, chain of command or having a particular uh, department or so on and so forth. But at the same time, one thing that's very relevant here is that the Prophet ﷺ, at the end of the day, this is not to comment on the lack of professionalism by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, wal-ayyadu billah, God forbid. But the lesson here is, the objective here is, the Prophet ﷺ, at the end of the day is available. The Prophet ﷺ is ultimately available. So if somebody wants to talk to him, needs to talk to him, they can talk to him. And that is something that is very important and very, very relevant in this particular instance. So they go to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, Oh Messenger of God, please help us. So the Prophet ﷺ, فَدَعَى بِإِنَاءٍ مِّمْ مَائِن He calls and he himself is not only available to speak to, but the Prophet ﷺ is so humble and so gracious and so generous that he himself comes forth to help. Rather than tell someone, do this and do that, he comes and he calls for a bowl of water. And when they bring him the water, فَتَفَلَ فِيهِ The Prophet ﷺ applied some of his saliva into that water. ثُمَّ دَعَى بِمَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَدْعُوَ بِهِ And then the Prophet ﷺ made dua. He prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ نَضَحَ الْمَا عَلَى تِلْكَ الْكُدْيَةِ Then the Prophet ﷺ sprayed and sprinkled that water. He put that water onto that big old boulder. فَيَقُولُ مَنْ حَضَرَهَا All of those who were present. All of those who were present, they say, فَوَالَّذِي بَعَثَهُ بِالْحَقِّ that we, that we swear by the one who sent the Prophet ﷺ with the truth. لَنْ هَالَتْ حَتَّى عَادَتْ كَالْكَثِيبِ مَا تَرُدُّ فَأْسًا وَلَا مِسْحَاتًا That the boulder just completely crumbled up into dust. To the point where the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum were able to remove it. When prior to that they were striking it with their uh, tools made of iron. And they couldn't even make a dent in it. And the Prophet ﷺ sprinkled this water and just completely crumbled in front of them. So that they could just scoop the dust out of the way. So this was one of the beautiful and miraculous events that occurred. Another very beautiful a miracle that occurred and it shows like just some very fascinating and, and even at some level you can say um, amusing interactions between the Prophet ﷺ and some of the Sahaba and amongst one another. Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the same one who narrated that, he said that after I saw the Prophet ﷺ roll up his sleeves, so to speak, get down into the trench, and then deal with the rock, and there's another incident I will talk about a little bit later, where the Prophet ﷺ actually smashed up a lot of rocks with his own hands, right? He took the tool and he was smashing even big rocks and tough rocks that nobody else was able to smash. He saw the Prophet ﷺ doing that, and the Prophet ﷺ, as I described, was covered in dust and dirt and he saw this and Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu said I just it just really struck me that look at the Prophet sallallahu and so he says that I after we were done dealing with a little bit of a situation we had there in the trench in terms of removing some of these stones and rocks that were obstructing the digging the project I asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, idhan li il al bayt. And I commented on this in the previous session that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the ones who take permission before they even visit their homes, they are believers. And the ones who are going around being absent, right? And the ones that are skipping out and hiding and ducking and avoiding responsibility, those are the ones who have, those are the ones who are hypocrites. They have a problem with their iman. So he sought permission, he said, oh, Messenger of God, allow me to just go and check in at home. And the Prophet ﷺ said, absolutely. So he says, I went home, and I said to my wife, رَأَيْتُ بِالنَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ شَيْئًا مَا كَانَ فِي ذَلِكَ صَبْرٌ I saw the Prophet ﷺ in a situation today that I cannot be patient with. Meaning, I saw the Prophet ﷺ in a situation that I can't tolerate. I can't bear to watch. Meaning that any one of us, when we're hungry, and we're dirty, and we're tired, and we're overwhelmed, that's fine. But to see the Prophet of Allah the beloved of Allah, 
May peace and blessings be upon him. In that situation, it broke my heart. I can't, I can't watch that. So she, he said that, فَعِنْدَكِ شَيْءٍ Is there anything you can do? Is there some food maybe you can prepare? I can bring him away from the trench just for a little while, sit him down. You know, tell him to get off of his feet, rest himself, eat some, you know, fresh made food. Just a little bit. And so she said that, عِنْدِي شَعِيرٌ وَعَنَاقٌ I have a little bit of flour, and I have a small little, like a lamb or a sheep, that I can, you know, prepare. فَذَبَحَتِ anaq. So she prepared the sheep, the lamb, she sacrificed the animal and prepared the meat. وَطَحَنَتِ الشَّعِيرٌ And she ground up the flour, right? She, she ground up the, the, the grain, rather, and, you know, made flour and was preparing bread and she had a pot in which she was cooking the meat so kind of like a meat stew and then she had a, an oven in which in the ground in which she was baking bread so he says that I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I and this is really fascinating he says that I came I, I, I crouched down next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I whispered in his ear because I knew how little food it was I whispered into his ear. And he said, my wife had told me, it's just a little bit of food. I said, okay. So I whispered into his ear, and he says, very fascinating, the Arabic. He said, فَقُلْتُ تُعَيِّمْ تُعَيِّمْ Not ta'am, تُعَيِّمْ Right? تُعَيِّمْ It means like a little bit of food. Just a little bit of food, O Messenger of Allah. تُعَيِّمٌ لِي فَقُمْ أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَرَجُلُنَا رَجُلَا Oh Messenger of God, I have a little bit of food. Little bit. So please, you come with me and maybe bring one or two people. I'm the Messenger of Allah, it's in the hadith of the Shama'il, the Prophet ﷺ never ever ate by himself. He never ate by himself. He always shared food with people. Right? And that was the advice of the Prophet ﷺ when he came to the city of Medina, that how do we establish a culture here in the city of Medina? What is the right type of culture? He said, أَطْعِمُوا الطَّعَامَةِ Feed food. And that doesn't simply mean أَطْعِمُوا masakin. He didn't say feed the poor. Obviously that means charity. But he wasn't just talking about charity. He said even when you're eating food on a daily basis, call your family members. Call your children. Call your wife. Call your husband. Right? Or call your neighbor over. Or if you're at work, pull over a co-worker. Ask a friend to have a seat with you. Just a brother walking out of the masjid and you're sitting outside having your lunch. Brother, please come have a seat. Have a, have a couple of bites. Share food. Because it builds relationships. It wins the hearts. And so the Prophet ﷺ never ate by himself. So he knew. So he said, O oh, Messenger of God, a little bit of food. Please come and bring one or two people with you. So the Prophet ﷺ asked, Kam huwa? How much food do you have exactly? فَذَكَرْتُ لَهُ So he says, I told the Prophet ﷺ, I have a little bit of food. Right? Another narration says, لَمَّا عَلِمَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم, That's the narration of Bukhari where he says that I told him I have a little bit of food. In another narration that Bayhaqi has, he said, لَمَّا عَلِمَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم بِمِقْدَارِ الطَّعَامِ That I, when the Prophet ﷺ knew exactly how little food I had, and yet there's a lengthy narration that's also found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, in which he also mentions that I told the Prophet ﷺ that I just have a little bit of food. So I made it very, very clear to him that I have just a little bit of food. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says at that time, and I pause for effect, because it's quite fascinating. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to me, he says, kathirun tayyibun. That's a lot of food. Kathirun, that's a lot of food. Mashallah. Tayyibun, and it's good food. MashaAllah. And he says, I have some instruction. Before we proceed, I have some instruction. Kullaha la tanzi al burmata wal al khubza min at tanuri hata atiya. Please tell your wife not to remove the, the meat, the stew from the pot, not to open up the pot, and not to remove the bread from the oven until I get there. Tell her, leave it there. Go in and turn off the stove, turn off the oven, but leave the food covered up in there until I get there. And then the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he said, Qumu. He said, let's go everybody. 
In another narration, the narration of uh, uh, Bayhaqi, he says, "Qumu ila Jabir." Everybody, we're going to Jabir's place. <laughs> and he says that I just stood there in awe. <laughs> What's going on? And this is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You don't argue with the man. So I just quietly proceeded, and I got home because he told me, "Go now, now go. We're all coming." Uh, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he also says, uh, he, he says, يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُهَاجِرُونَ وَالْأَنصَارِ قُومُوا Oh, muhajirin and ansar, let's go. So the Prophet ﷺ sent me ahead. He said, now go tell your wife this instruction. So I ran ahead. When I got home, I told my wife that, I said one narration, he says, وَيْحَكِي He says, you're ruined. Right to his wife. She says, what happened? He says, جاء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالمهاجرين والانصار ومن معهم the Prophet ﷺ brought the Muhajireen, he brought the Ansar and everybody else. In another narration, the and then she says, Hal Sa'alaka? Did he ask you for permission? Like, did he ask you if it was okay? And he says, Naam, yeah, he meaning she no, sorry, she says, Hal Sa'alaka in another narration. She says, Did he ask you how much food you have? Does he know how much food we have? And she, he says, Yes, Naam, yeah, I told him exactly how much food we have. In another narration, he says, فَلَقِيْتُ مِنَ الْحَيَاءِ مَا لَا يَعْلَمُهُ إِلَّا الله. At that moment, I was so embarrassed and ashamed. When the Prophet ﷺ said, قُومُوا Let's go everybody. قُومُوا إِلَى جَابِرِ I felt so embarrassed that all these people are going to show up at the house and there's not going to be any food for anyone. And I went home and I told my wife, جَاءَ بِالْخَلْقِ عَلَى صَاعٍ مِنْ شَعِيرٍ وَعَنَاقٍ I said that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is coming with all of mankind. Right? And all we have is a little bit of bread and a little bit of meat. And I told my wife, if tadahti, you're gonna be humiliated today, right? Ja'aki Rasulullah sallallahu bil khandaq ajma'in. The Prophet sallallahu brought everybody from the trench. So she says, hal, hal kana sa'alaka kam ta'amuk? Did he ask you how much food you have? Qultu na'am. I said, yes. So she said, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. She said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. She said, you people, you say this all the time. Allah and His Messenger know best. Do you believe it or not? Do you believe that God and His Messenger know what they're doing? So she, he says, فَكَشَفَتْ عَنِّي غَمَّنْ شَدِيدًا Immediately I stopped worrying. I said, the Messenger of God has a plan. So I stopped worrying. And at that time, he says that the Prophet ﷺ walked in and he sat down next to where the, uh, the pot cooking the meat was and then where the oven where the bread was being baked. He sat down and he told, um, you know, uh, my wife, خُذِي وَدَعِينِي مِنَ اللَّحْمِ He said that, let me handle this. Sister, have a seat. Let me handle this, I got this. وَجَعَلَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى يَثْرُدُ وَيَغْرِفُ اللَّحْمَ ثُمَّ يُخَمِّرُ هَذَا وَيُخَمِّرُ هَذَا He says then the Prophet ﷺ started taking without opening up the oven. He said, Bismillah, he reached inside. He would break a piece of bread. He would reach inside the pot. He would put some meat on that bread, kind of like wrap it up. And then he would hand it to one person. Then he would reach down, get a piece of bread, put a piece of meat in, and hand it to another person. And a third person, and a fourth person, and a fifth person, and a sixth person. And the Prophet ﷺ told everyone, Udkhulu wa la tadaganu. Keep on walking in, but don't push, don't shove. Single file order. Right? Just get in the line and just keep coming in, get your food and proceed out and let others come. And the Prophet ﷺ kept serving like this, taking a piece of bread, putting a piece of meat and handing it to people with his own hands. And one narration says that he served 300 people. Another narration says he served 800 people. And he sat there and served them himself with his own hands. This entire meal was prepared for the sake of the Messenger ﷺ. But he was more worried about everybody else eating than himself. That's leadership. When that type of compassion, when that type of mercy, when that type of selflessness is found within leadership, then that creates, breeds the type of followers that the Sahaba were. 
And so he sits there and he serves. فَمَازَالَ يُقَرِّبُ إِلَى النَّاسِ حَتَّى شَبِعُوا أَجْمَعِينَ And he kept on serving people until every single person had been, had been fed, had been helped. And then finally, Jabir says that after he was done feeding everyone, the f- he says in another narration that the pot that the meat was cooked in was still completely full. And the oven in which the bread was baked in was still completely full. And so at that time, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, said to Jabir's wife that Kuli wa ahdi. Kuli wa ahdi. Now please, sister, you go Kuli hada wa ahdi. You eat and give to others, share to others, give it to your neighbors. Fa inna nasa asabatum maja'a. Because the people are very hungry. So please, sister, you eat and share it with your neighbors and call other people to come and eat. And you know what the fascinating thing is? And of course, you can kind of, I guess, to some extent, maybe assume that of course the Prophet ﷺ must have eaten. The Sahaba would have ensured that he ate. But a little bit of, just a little thought to entertain. There are four or five different variations of this narration in Sahih Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, in Bayhaqi, in Ibn Ishaq, in Ibn Kathir. So many different versions, not a single one of them mentions the Prophet ﷺ eating. It mentions him serving food, it mentions him calling the family of Jabir, giving them the food, telling them to call their neighbors, and said, please, eat, and also share the food with people, because the people are very hungry. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa got up, wiped his hands, and walked away. So this was a very beautiful and miraculous event that shows just, you know, the remarkable um, nature of the Messenger Sallallahu and how the help from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala came, you know, in such an unexpected fashion. Salman al Farisi, radiAllahu Taala Anhu, who we've talked about before, and I believe I've kind of mentioned this earlier as well, but this is where, you know, to point out another very powerful and miraculous event that occurred at the digging of the trench. Salman al Farisi, radiAllahu Taala Anhu tells his own story and he talks about the fact that وَاحْتَقَّ الْمُهَاجِرُونَ وَالْأَنصَارُ فِي سَلْمَانِ and so that some of the uh, muhajirun and the ansar they started debating about whose group Salman should be a part of because Salman radiallahu ta'ala anhu was Persian right so he wasn't exactly a muhajir he didn't come from Mecca nor was he an ansari he didn't come from Medina so they were arguing and debating the muhajirun said but he's still an outsider he's not a Madinan native so he should dig with us and the ansar said well but he was in Medina before you guys came to Medina so when the prophet sallallahu came to Medina he was already a resident of Medina as a slave of the of a jewish man so technically in that sense he's an ansari because he was in Medina before the Prophet ﷺ or the Muslims came. And so much like we would probably argue about you take him, no you take him. I don't want you know the Persian on my team, some outsider. No, no, you take him, no you take him. They're saying we'll take him and they're saying we'll take him. And it became such a serious disagreement because of the sincerity of the brotherhood and the love that they had amongst one another that they started debating and arguing. And when it was brought to the Prophet ﷺ's attention, the Prophet ﷺ said, Salman will not dig with the Ansar nor will he dig with the Muhajirun. Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt. Salman will dig with me and my family. So Salman radiallahu ta'ala anhu he describes a very powerful thing. He says that the Prophet of Allah, there was a big old rock inside of the trench that nobody was able to really smash or break. So finally, as we used to do in these situations, we called the Prophet ﷺ. So in one narration, he actually says, "What Rasulullah minni." He said, I was in there just pounding away at that stone and I couldn't even make a dent in it and the Prophet ﷺ was close by فَلَمَّا رَآنِي أَضْرِبُ وَرَآ شِدَّةَ الْمَكَانَ عَلَيَّ when the Prophet ﷺ saw that I was like putting everything I had into it and I was getting fatigued and exhausted the Prophet ﷺ descended down into the trench he took the axe or the, the, the pick or whatever from my hand, the tool, he took it from my hand and the Prophet ﷺ reached back and he said in one narration the Prophet ﷺ recited an ayah of the Qur'an 
where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدَلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struck the rock. And he says a third of the rock cracked and broke off, but this like, almost like this glimmer or this spark kind of like came out, shot out from it. And he says that I was watching all of this. Then again the Prophet ﷺ reached back and he said, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدَلًا Which translates as that the promise of God will be fulfilled with truth and justice. There is no one that can change the decree of God. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and all knowing. He recited that particular ayah. Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 115. And so he struck the rock again, saying this ayah, and another third of the rock, you know, cracked and fell, it crumbled. And that same spark, burqa, like barqa, like this little spark came out from there. And I saw it. And then again he said, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدَقًا وَعَدَلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And he struck the last third of the rock and it crumbled. And again that same light came shooting out of it. So when he was done, the Prophet ﷺ then got out from the trench and he took off his, you know, he had given his shawl. He was wearing a shawl, he had given his shawl to someone to be able to hit the rock. He took his shawl and he wrapped it around himself and he sat down. So I came to the Prophet ﷺ and I said, Ya Rasulullah, Salman says, رَأَيْتُكَ حِينَ ضَرَبَتْ لَا تَضْرِبُ ضَرْبَةً إِلَّا كَانَتْ مَعَهَا بُرْقَةٌ He says that I saw that every single time you struck the rock, this light came shooting out of it. قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَا سَلْمَانَ رَأَيْتَ ذَلِكَ He said, Salman, you saw it too? And he says, O Messenger of Allah, إِي وَالَّذِي بَعَثَكَ بِالْحَقِّ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Yes, O Messenger of God, I swear to the one who sent you with the truth. I saw it as well. The Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم at that time, he commented, he said, when I struck the rock the very first time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me the palaces of the emperor of Persia. And when I struck the rock a second time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me <clears throat> the palaces of the emperor of Rome. And when I struck the rock a third time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me the palaces of the... Um, he says that he showed me the, 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 the land from the east to the west in one narration, he says. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first showed me Persia, then He showed me Rome, then He showed me from the east to the west. And He said that, what does this mean, O Messenger of Allah? He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us that basically all of these areas will enter into the Muslim lands. That Islam will spread far and wide to Persia, to Rome, from the east to the west. Islam will spread. And all of the Sahaba, when they heard this, they said, Alhamdulillah, maw'udun sadiqun. And they recited the ayah of the Qur'an of Surah Al-Ahzab. It was revealed at this time, هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا That this is the promise that God has made us, that Allah has made us. And this is the promise that the Messenger of Allah has made to us. And Allah and His Messenger speak the truth always. And this promise from Allah and His Messenger did nothing but increase the faith and the belief of the companions, the believers, the Sahaba. But the munafiqoon, as they saw and they heard this entire interaction, the Muslims are saying, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, and they're celebrating this good news, right? The munafiqoon, the hypocrites, they started to say that, يُخْبِرُكُمْ أَنَّهُ يُبْصِرُ مِنْ يَثْرِبْ قُسُورَ الْحِيرَةِ وَمَدَائِنِ كُسْرَى That he tells you from Medina that he can see the palaces of Persia and Rome, وَأَنَّهَا تُفْتَحُ لَكُمْ and that Islam will spread far and wide. وَأَنْتُمْ تَحْفِرُونَ الْخَنْدَقْ لَا تَسْتَطِيعُونَ أَنْ تَبَرَّزُوا When in reality, look at, you, look at you people right now. You're digging a trench. You don't, you don't even have the ability to be able to go out there and fight your enemy openly in the battlefield. And yet you sit here and you talk about conquering Persia and conquering Rome. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed about these particular people. وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا That the hypocrites and those people whose hearts are polluted, are diseased, they say that the, what Allah and His Messenger promises is nothing but lies. They, they, they're just promising us delusional things. غُرُورًا They're deceiving us. And this exposed 
the faith of the believers and the hypocrisy of the hypocrites and the disbelief of the disbelievers. So this was another very miraculous incident that at that particular time in the hard work when things got to the point where the Sahaba couldn't even crack this, these rocks, they couldn't even get past these stones. Where the Prophet ﷺ had to remove his shawl and get down into the trench and get dirt and dust all over him. And he had to reach back and he had to strike the rock with all of his might and finally smash and crack the rock. That at that particular time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the good news of how far and wide Islam would spread. What I wanted to kind of emphasize here at the end of the session today is the simple fact that the greatest victories are achieved in the most difficult of moments. That this is an example from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the legacy of Rasulullah ﷺ. This is why we study the seerah. And why we study the book of Allah. To realize and to understand that victories are not achieved. Real true victories. A victory that not only results in good in this world, but especially the good of the life of the hereafter. These things are not achieved, you know, in, in moments of glory. And these are not just simply achieved through dominating and overpowering your enemy. But rather, in the most difficult, arduous moments. When it seems like everything is closing in on you. When you're at your very last you know, you're, you're on your very, you know, you're at the very end of your ability and strength. Where you're crumbling and falling under the pressure. When you have very few options left. And it seems like things are becoming very bleak. And the world is closing in on you. But in that moment when you stand firm and you have conviction and you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you pray to Allah and you turn to the example of the Messenger وسلم, you draw inspiration from the book of Allah, from the life of the Prophet وسلم, that is where the greatest victories are achieved. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ That you will achieve the ultimate and true victory if in fact truly you are believers. And true faith and belief is realized. Not just, not just manifested or proven, but rather true faith is even realized. Your iman will reach levels like never before when it seems like you have no other options available to you and you turn to Allah in that moment. Where it becomes that either your only option is Allah. Which was always your only option. But sometimes in our human delusions, we think we have a multitude of different options. But there will be a moment, there will be moments, where all those other alleged or supposed options will be taken off the table. And there will only be one clear and obvious option left, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and turning to Allah. And when you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that particular moment, and you pay, place your full faith and trust in Allah. هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا That's when you realize true iman and true faith. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants victory to true believers. And people who truly place their faith and trust in Allah. And at that point in time they were told that you might be down in the trenches right now, quite literally. Hungry, tired, Exhausted and fatigued. But this sacrifice, you know a lot of times as almost like a cliche. We say that, you know, the sacrifices of the earlier generations, the hard work of earlier generations made possible for us what we're enjoying and what we're doing today. At some point in time it has to be more than a cliche. Or a fancy thing to say. And we actually have to understand. That the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba digging, digging there in the trenches with full faith and conviction. We're told that Islam, because of this sacrifice today, will spread far and wide. And we are sitting here halfway across the world, sitting in a house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, talking about the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, realizing that legacy, and beneficiaries of those sacrifices that they made. And the reason why I mention this is to, of course, first and foremost, not only develop a sense of respect an appreciation for the Messenger of Allah And a sense of admiration for that generation, the Sahaba, who stood firm by the side of the Prophet and did what had to be done. 
But at the same time, for us to internalize the fact that we might also be called upon to make sacrifices, to step forth, to do what needs to be done. So that future generations can benefit from Islam and Iman the way that we are benefiting here today. And at, the, at that moment, it will be our test. Do we, stand, do we answer the call or not? Are we up for the challenge or not? And the going might get really tough. But always realize this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا نُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That Allah never wastes the reward, the effort of those people who put forth a sincere and a remarkable exemplary effort. The help of Allah will come to us as well, inshaAllah, miraculously, as it came to them. And we will have the opportunity to lay the bricks and the foundation for generations to come. And have a stake and a share in the reward of what those future generations will achieve and accomplish. Make no mistake as we pray to Aisha here. And we sat here and are listening in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the discussion about the Quran and the life of the Prophet sallallahu That all the reward that we're earning and all the blessings that are being achieved right now. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Those people who stood there in the trench digging. That day, over 1400 years ago, they have a share and a stake in the reward of all of this. Our teachers used to always remind us whenever we would sit and study ilm and study knowledge, they used to always remind us that from the Sahaba to the Tabi'un to the Tabi'u Tabi'i, all the people in the chain of narration, the Isnad, and the author of the book, and all the teachers and the students that taught that book since that time up until today, all of their book of deeds, they are long gone from the world. Many of them, maybe the world even forgot their names. But all of their book of deeds are still open till today. And as we sit here reading this, they are collecting reward equal to whatever we are getting as well. That's the opportunity that we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us for the service of the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from the legacy and the life of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions in the serving of the deen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakhfirka wa natubu ilayk. I noticed we were joined by a few extra brothers and sisters here today. So if you would like to inshallah catch up with the series and benefit from the series that we've been having over a span of almost three, four years now here at the Irving Masjid on the life of the Prophet ﷺ. You can go to the Qalam website, qalaminstitute.org slash podcast. You can go on iTunes as well and you will find all the previous sessions on the podcast and that's where you can inshallah download them, listen to them and share them with others as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.